Hey everyone, I'm uh, recording this video uh, as promised to review um, some of your questions about the Chapter 6 uh, homework problems. So I've got the discussion thread here um, up and we'll just knock them out. So let's go through them. Um, so here's a question about exercise 4. Um, this is the one about the propositional, non-propositional conjunctions, trying to figure out whether you need to translate it as just P or P and Q, something like that. And let's talk about the Ken and Naomi one. Sorry, I had to sneeze there. I always have to sneeze when I do these. Woo! Um, so here we go. Ken and Naomi are two of my best friends. So uh, I think this theme is going to show up with uh, some questions a little bit later on here too. But when we're doing translations into formal logic, we have to make uh, some, uh, we have to first kind of determine what that universe of discourse is, uh, which sets up what the simple propositions are that then we make more complex claims out of. So all the formal logic is about this theme of how we can make more logically nuanced or complex claims out of simple propositions. Uh, there is a, a version of formal logic, uh, a symbolic system called predicate logic, which breaks down claims even further uh, into the subject and the predicate of a simple proposition. Um, but that's uh, that's a bridge too far for our purposes here. But the the system we're using is propositional logic, which treats uh, as the basic sort of unit of expressions uh, a full proposition. So subject, something we're talking about, and some predicate, like the car is red. You know, the car is what we're talking about. The predicate that's true of it is that it's red. It has the property of being red. So anytime we're going to do any translations, we got to figure out, we have to sort of define what these simple propositions are. And that's going to happen in this case here too. Um, the, the technique that I told you to use uh, is to first try to see if you can get the statement into something that is propositional, that has this P and Q form. Something is true and something else is true. And if that feels like it's distorting the meaning of the original English sentence, then we may have to go back on that and just treat it as a simple proposition. Uh, so we, we want to take a shot at it. And let's actually do a, a one that's a little less complicated first. Um, Jane speaks both French and English. Okay, so Jane speaks French. That's a simple proposition. We could define F as Jane speaks French. This is way too large. Let's make this a little smaller. Jane speaks French. And let's have E stand for Jane speaks English. We're trying to break it up, and we get this, and then we would put the translation as this, F and E, a propositional conjunction. Does that seem to capture all the information that's being given in this original sentence we're translating? Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. So that's going to work out fine. That's a, it's a great translation. Now contrast that with the next one. Someone who speaks both French and English is bilingual. Let's see if we can make that ha happen. Um, let's have F stand for, let's try to break it up. We get someone who speaks French is bilingual. And then someone who speaks English is bilingual. Is that working? Uh, no, because this makes no sense as an independent fact. Someone who speaks French is bilingual? No, that makes no sense. Uh, you, if you just speak one language, that doesn't mean you're bilingual, that you can speak multiple languages. Um, so this isn't working. So we're going to have to reduce it to just a simple proposition. Maybe we would call it this. Someone who speaks both French and English is bilingual. There we go. And then we just would translate it as a simple proposition B. It's just one claim. That's all it's being made. There's no component parts to it. We can't break down the structure. So it's non-propositional. So what do we do when we get at this weird one? Um, Ken and Naomi are two of my best friends. Well, if we did it like this, K, K, 
Ken is two of my best friends. Um, N. This makes no sense. Like, <laughs> this isn't going to work. Ken is two of my best friends? No, that makes no sense. So that might lead you to think that this has got to be treated as uh, non-propositional, like just a simple proposition. Ken and Naomi are two of my best friends. But we don't have to be mechanical here. We don't have to use this copy and paste um, method of dealing with English. Um, we can think about the ideas that are being represented by the English words. Now, just as a side note, I, I finished grading all the exams yesterday, and I saw a lot of standard form translations of arguments, even before we got into the formal logic stuff, where students were, I think, doing it way too mechanically and just copy and pasting the language from the problem into standard form when that really didn't capture the ideas very clearly at all. They are intended to be revised, that you sometimes do have to re-articulate in order to draw out what the idea is. That's the same kind of skill we're using here. Um, Ken and Naomi are two of my best friends does seem to be presenting two pieces of information, not just one. And so if we massage it a little bit, we can get it there. What if we just said, Ken is one of my best friends, and Naomi is one of my best friends? Then we can translate this as K and N, and we don't seem to have any loss of meaning. Uh, we're saying, one fact, Ken is one of my best friends. Second fact, Naomi is one of my best friends. Does that get all the information that's going on here? Yeah, we have, we have, that doesn't seem to be distorting anything. So sometimes how we identify what these simple propositions are to draw out the ideas of the information that's being claimed uh, allows us to, uh, to, to get at this underlying structure um, in a better way. So that, that's what's going on with the Ken and Naomi one. <clears throat> Let's... Um, I think there was another one. Yeah, this one's about translations. Um, and there's some translation stuff here, too. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll come back to this one here, the exercise 12 one. Yeah, let's go to 28 here. Do, do, do. All right, America will win the Olympics unless China does. China will win the Olympics unless Germany does. So America will win the Olympics unless Germany does. Uh, first, we've got to figure out what's the conclusion, what are the premises, and then we're going to translate each one of them into logic. Um, so uh, it'd be helpful to hear a clarification on this question, how to translate these arguments into symbolic notation, test each argument for truth functional validity using truth table techniques. OK, I want to focus first on just the translation one. And then we'll do the truth table later. So <clears throat> the conclusion of this argument is here. America will win the Olympics unless Germany does. We've got a nice conclusion marker right here with so that makes it obvious what's happening here. Now this is an unless statement. And if you remember from the lectures, unless is just a disjunction. It's, it's like saying or. Um, America will win the Olympics or Germany will win the Olympics. Um, <clears throat> A, R, and E are maybe not the most intuitive uh, letters to represent this for the universe of discourse. but So I, I'm not going to work with them. I'm, I'm happy to do something different. Um, let's have A stand for America wins the Olympics, and G stands for Germany uh, wins the Olympics. So it's an or statement. So I know it's going to be something like um, A or G. But remember, all cases of unless and all cases of either or, any disjunction, you always need to ask yourself, is it the inclusive or do we also need to put on this but not both? And to figure that out, whether this is necessary or not, sometimes you have to look at context clues here. Um, would, would it be possible for both of these things to happen? Is that consistent with the truth of this statement? Presumably, there cannot be two winners here. Maybe they could tie or something like that. So uh, if you were thinking it's possible for there to be a tie, and that's how you're going to interpret what win means, then you might have just left it as this one. 
But if you're thinking winning means more than anyone else, well, then it's not possible for that to be true for both of them. So we, whoa, sorry about that. We would need to put uh, both of those in. We, need, we would need to rule out the possibility of both to capture this accurately. Now, this is, this is a case of the inclusive, exclusive choice that I don't think is super a big deal here. Um, so we, we could do it either way. Um, let's just leave it. At, I do think that in context here, the way I interpret it is as exclusive. Um, so let's, let's leave it at that. But if you did it inclusive, that'd be fine too. Okay, and then we got to figure out what the premises are. What are the other claims that are offered? Well, we got two. America will win the Olympics unless China does, and China will win the Olympics unless Germany does. They're really the same form as what we got here, just with different subjects. So we would have A or C. Let's have C stand for China wins the Olympics. And then here we have C or G. Uh, again, both of them, if I'm interpreting this one as exclusive, I'm going to interpret the other ones as exclusive too. So we're going to have, um, well, let's just go back. It doesn't matter the order here, but we got China or Germany. So C or D eh, and not C and G. And then we also have A or C and not A and C. I think I, I think I got that right. Let's see. Yep. All right. And then we throw in, uh, we got to put our little line here because this is standard form. <clears throat> and remember again, when you're translating for arguments, there's going to be more than one symbolic expression. It's not just going to be one big string of symbols. Uh, we're going to have a, a different logical expression for each claim in the argument, the two premises that we have here and the conclusion. So now the next thing we'd have to do is set up the truth table and figure out if this argument is valid or not. Um, so let's do that. We're going to have uh, we have a bunch of different propositional letters here, A, C, and G. So I'm going to have to make uh, a column for each of those to set up all the possibilities here. And again, as I like to do this, I like to put a double line here to mark what are just the conditions that we're calculating possibilities under from all the other claims that are actually being made in the argument. So let's uh, let me just grab these. There's one. There's another. Uh-oh, I'm going to run out of space, aren't I? Made my font too big. Oops. There's the other one that's going off the screen here. All right, shoot. I'm going to have to make this ever so slightly smaller. All right, there we go. And then we're going to make lines here to separate out each column for each claim in the argument. Again, as I also like to do and I encourage you to do, it's good to mark what are the premises and what's the conclusion. Just so when we, when we get to the later stage of checking for validity. All right, there we go. So we're not confused about that. All right, now I gotta fill out the truth table. So with three possibilities, three different propositional letters that could either be true or false, we're gonna have eight total possibilities to deal with. So I'll make four true, four false. And then we'll go two by two. True, true, false, false, true, true, false, false. Again, this method will make sure that you get all the possibilities covered you won't have any duplicates, and you won't have any repeated ones. There we go. Now, <clears throat> even though this, these expressions are a little more complicated, 
um, when we're looking at uh, this exclusive disjunction. We could crunch this out the long way, but maybe at this point you're pretty familiar with the meaning of the exclusive disjunction. So uh, here, let me pull up a thing that we had before. Um, the truth table diagram. You saw this in a video before, right? We know we know the inclusive or works like this, right? When uh, at least one of them is true, then it's true. The only thing that makes the exclusive one, the version that we had over here, different is that when they're both true, it's a false value instead of a true value. Otherwise, it operates like the the inclusive or. So we can remember that here and maybe do this a lot quicker. Here I'm comparing A and C. So with the exclusive or, if A and C are both true, well, that's supposed to be a false value. And that's happening in the next row here. A and C are still both true. And then down here, at least one of them is true and not the other, right? One or the other, but not both, applies to these cases and to these cases. But then it is saying at least one of them is true, so a case in which they both are false will be a false result. Um, if that's still feeling a little funky to you about how these calculations happen, uh, let's talk about it. Um, I, I've given some in that video before uh, that I made about advice about how to attack these homework problems. Um, I walked through how to do that in a, in a more lo long extended version. So I'm not going to do that here. But if, if that wasn't good enough, if you're, you're still feeling shaky about it, that's when I've been encouraging students to contact me so we can do some things together. We could video chat and work on some truth tables at the same time and I could see how you're approaching it and what advice I could give you or see, try to diagnose like what might be the hang up here and how we can get you unstuck. Um, but I'm going to proceed here uh, as, as if um, I'm not going to go through all those details again right now. So here with uh, this exclusive disjunction, C and G, I'm now comparing the C and G values. When they're both true, for the exclusive, that's a false value. Here, one of them is true but not both, so that's true. Here, uh, one of them is true but not both, so that's true. Here, they're both false, so that's a false value. Here, they're both true, that's a false value. Here, at least one of them is true but not both. That's happening here too, and it's not happening here, so that's false. And then finally, for the last one, now I'm looking at A and G. So here they're both true. That's not what we wanted. Here at least one of them is true, but not both, so that's true. Here both of them are true, so that's the one that's being ruled out. Here at least one of them is true, but not both. Here at least one of them is true, but not both. Here they're both false, that's not supposed to happen. Here at least one of them is true but not both. And here they're both false, so that's not supposed to be happening either. So there we go. We got our truth tables completed, and now we just have one last thing to check. Can we construct a counterexample? A case where all the premises are true, and yet um, the conclusion is false. Is that happening? We can just look at it. we got all, all the possibilities calculated, and we've seen what are the truth values for all the claims. Do we ever have a possibility here in which this happens? Is there a row in which all the premises are true and the conclusion false? And the answer, drum roll, is yes, that's happening here. And we have another one here. All it would take is one, but we have a counterexample. So that means the argument is invalid. Ooh, invalid. There we go. So that's 28 for you, or that problem from 28. Um, so we got the translation, and then once you got the translation, you can run your whole game about truth tables um, to check for validity. So that's how that would look. Um, all right. Um, would it, and then uh, Sandra asks here, would it be possible to see the breakdown how you did, Tim, in the Chapter 6 demo lecture where you underlined and circled the gluing words? So yeah, we can go back here. The glue words here are really the unless uh, words in, in number 9 here. Um, that's what's making complex, a complex statement out of these simple propositions. Okay, I, I hope this is working for you. Um, I really wish I could talk. Uh, when we do these homework reviews in class, it's great because I can explain it and see how it went. And I just have to hope that does the trick for you. If it doesn't, contact me and let me know.
always happy to say more things. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, here's another one from 28. Um, the either, the either way here. The Democrats will run either Jones or Borg. Either way, I will get soup. Um, 11 is much more straightforward than 12. 12 is fun. I like it because it's another case where like copy and paste method just won't work for you. You're going to have to do the thing I've been encouraging, which is listening for the information and figuring out what logical operators sort of capture the information that's really being offered here. But let's do 11 first. This is much more straightforward. So Democrats will run either Jones or Borg. Um, we could break this down into simple propositions. The Democrats run Jones. The Democrats run Borg. Let, let's do that. Uh, select all. Oops. Delete. Okay. So if we're if we're creating our universe of discourse here, we could have J stand for the Democrats run Jones. B could be the Democrats run Borg. All right. So if they're saying the Democrats will run either Jones or Borg, then they're saying one of two things will happen. Either the Democrats run Jones or the Democrats run Borg. And again, we have to ask ourselves, is that it? Is it just the inclusive or here or but not both? And again, context might give you the clues here. Uh, when it comes to these sorts of elections, sometimes you can have multiple candidates, and sometimes you can have only one. So like in the presidential race, it's ultimately going to come down to one nominee that the party presents. Um, but we just had some elections happen this week, <clears throat> this last weekend, uh, locally, and you've got candidates who, you might have multiple candidates that are running as Democrats or as Republicans or as independents. So uh, what's the context here they give us? Uh, I mean, they're talking about winning the <clears throat> South or the North. So this, I think, I mean, the most reasonable interpretation here, since it's ambiguous, is that this is a national election, in which case they can only they only are going to nominate one candidate. If that's what's going on, then we would have to do this. And if this is a little frustrating that it's, like, ambiguous, um, uh, it's tough luck. Uh, sometimes things are ambiguous. That's just how things work. And logic can't make up for any ambiguity that's in the English um, w within certain limits. So we're always trying to make things a little less fuzzy as much as we can using the tools we've got. But sometimes there's still some genuine ambiguity that's left over even after we've done everything in our power. Um, in this case, I'm using a little bit of inductive reasoning based on my background assumptions here uh, to think that this is probably the situation, um, but if your answer looked just like this, that'd be okay. okay. But this kind of either or situation is the most straightforward. Uh, there's just two possibilities that they're saying could happen. Okay. Now when we do this one here, uh, in 12, either way I will get soup. I, actually, let's do the whole thing here. I, I like to do this whole problem. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit more than you asked for. Uh, Let's have F stand for I ordered the fish special. That's a simple proposition. It's a simple state of affairs that this argument is talking about in some way. So we've got I order the fish special, I order the meat special, and then I get soup. Okay. So again, we have a nice conclusion marker. I get soup is the conclusion. Oh, no. There we go. Uh, oops. Shoot. Uh, let's erase our whiteboard. There we go. Conclusion here is I get soup. That's just S. Nothing more to see here. Um, what are the other things that we've got here uh, for premises? We've got I'm going to order either the fish special or the meat special. And another claim is either way I'll get soup. So uh, let's handle this one first. I'm going to order either the fish special or the meat special. They're saying there's two possibilities here. Uh, let's have, we'll keep it in the order that it was in the problem. Um, so I'm going to order the fish special or I'm going to order the meat special. Now again, there's kind of a question here. Like, is it one or the other? At least one of these two things is true. Or is it one or the other but not both? Inclusive or exclusive? 
With my background assumptions, people don't usually order two entrees. Maybe this is a fancy restaurant, so uh, it's probably the case that I'm going to order one or the other, but not both. That's not going to happen. It actually won't matter for this argument whether it's inclusive or exclusive, um, for whether the argument is valid or not. Um, but let's keep it like that. Uh, again, if you if you had just this, that would have been fine. All right. Now here's the tricky one. Either way, I will get soup. Either way, I'll get soup. What would be your clue here for how to approach this? Um, again, I always think it's right here to listen to just the information. What kind of information are you getting? Uh, let's go through our operators. With and, it's you've got two facts. With or, it's two possibilities. With uh, conditionals, it's saying there's a link, a hypothetical link between these two possible states of affairs. That one is a sufficient or necessary condition for the other. A biconditional is saying these two things are the same thing. They basically always go together or you don't get either one. Um, and negation is denying something. Well, we don't have a negation here. This isn't an and statement. And it's not really an or statement either. Um, it's not saying there are two possibilities. It's really saying there's one possibility here, right? You're going to get the soup either way. So that the fact that it's talking about what happens under certain hypothetical conditions should would be your clue that this is really a conditional statement. It's kind of like a if something, then something else. Okay? If this, then some result. So we, we know it's going to have... Or maybe maybe we don't know exactly yet what's going to go on either side of this, but we know it's going to be a conditional of some kind. If something, then something else. Well, what's going to be the result here? <clears throat> either way, I get soup. So it's like, if something happens, then I get soup. So we can fill out this one here as soup. What about the other one? The either way. No matter what happens with, what are the two either ways here? It's the fish special or the meat special. So it's like, if either one of those things happens, I'm going to get soup. That's what they're saying here. If either one of those two possibilities occurs, then I get the soup. Mm -hmm. That's getting us a little closer to language that might fit here. So if either one happens, we can express that in logic like this. If I have the fish special or the meat special, then I get soup. And there you go. That would be the, the proper translation here. Um, we'll make it all pretty here. Bring out a little therefore symbol in there. There we are. So I'm going to have the fish special or the meat special, but not both. If I get either the fish special or the meat special, then I get soup. So guess what? I'm getting soup. That's how you'd handle that one. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so just questions about that one. Yeah. Okay, so I, I hope that answers your question about that. Um, some, some English phrases are more straightforward. They're already using language that fits very naturally to how we've been talking about our operators. Other cases, you're going to have to think about it a little bit more. It might have a little non-standard syntax or grammar to it. Um, and But the, the foolproof thing, or not the foolproof thing, I should say, your main tool for sorting this stuff out is always going to be, I think, starting with your listening ear. Just your intuition. Like, you're, like I, I've said from the beginning of the class, like, you don't need this class to be able to think and talk. Like, you already have a lot of intuitive competency for doing this. Even if English is your second language, you've got, you know how communication goes. Um, you can figure that kind of stuff out. Um, and you can trust your intuition a little bit here. Just checking up on your intuition with these more rigorous tools of formal analysis and articulation. So like, am I, is this really capturing the information that I hear intuitively that is being said in the original passage I'm analyzing? Um, so I, I hope that helps. I hope that works for you. Um, there will be tricky cases, and you've got to make your best, best call on it. Um, but those are some tools that you've got. Uh, specifically, the upshot with this problem here is thinking about conditionals as like the horseshoe stuff when we're going to when we're going to be translating with the horseshoe 
that we're talking about hypotheticals. If something, then something else. That there's a link between the a conditional link between these two states of affairs. That's the thing that you can listen for to know that there's a, uh, a conditional happening. And then you can use that technique I've talked about before about if you if you really want to double check it, translating the English sentence into something equivalent that involves sufficient necessary condition talk and using the Sun principle to figure out what gets on what side. Um, okay. And then also we've got one from 28 here, uh, number seven. Why we interpret it as if P then H instead of H. Oh, so just the thing I was just talking about. Okay. Uh, just a habit to work on getting out of. Um, you interpret it the other way. Okay, let's take a look at it. Uh, number seven here. John will play only if the situation is hopeless, but the situation is hopeless, so John will play. Um, all right, let's let's tackle this one. Actually, can I do the thing here where I I will copy it? Oops. Uh, this thing's been giving me technical difficulties. Oh well, that's fine. All right, we get, again we got a nice man. They use a lot of the conclusion markers of so in these examples. That's helpful to us. So conclusion is John will play. I think that's what P is intended to stand for. So again on the exam, I'm not just going to give you letters. I'm going to spell it out for you so you don't have to worry about it. But let's have P stand for John will play. So the conclusion here is P. By the way, uh, sometimes students get thrown off on this. A lot of the homework problems have two premises and a conclusion, but arguments don't need to have two premises. They could have one premise, they could have three premises, or four or five, there's no upper limit here. It's just a coincidence that a lot of these end up having two premises. Um, so, oh gosh, okay. So there we are. Conclusion is John will play. One of the premises is the situation is hopeless. And I think that's what H is supposed to stand for. So this premise would just be H. All right, what about the first part? John will play only if the situation is hopeless. Um, I think the intuition that you're wrestling with, who is this? Uh, Kaylee, Kaylee, you mentioned this one. Um, yeah, I think that there, I've mentioned before, our intuitions about conditionals are a little tricky. So the, with conditionals, it might be good to take that intuitive report that you're getting and really double check it with our analytic tools to confirm, yeah, this is what's supposed to be happening here. Um, but the only if pattern is not the same as the if pattern. So if it said, John will play if the situation is hopeless, then it would be, um, so yeah, let me, can I get that in here? Ah, let's look at this. John will play if the situation is hopeless versus John will play only if the situation is hopeless. So these are our two options here. And again, we've got the Sun principle to help us out, right? The, the antecedent is a sufficient condition for the consequent, and the consequent is a necessary condition for the antecedent. So if they're saying John will play only if the uh, John will play if the situation is hopeless, that's straightforwardly if H then J or uh, P. Sorry, we had P here for John will play. So if the situation is hopeless, then John will play. But when they say John will play only if the situation is hopeless, they're saying the situation being hopeless is a necessary condition for John to play. Any other situation, he's not going to play. So if the situation being hopeless is the necessary condition for John playing, it's got to show up in the necessary condition spot. So play will be on this side, and H will be on uh, and the situation being hopeless will be on that side. Okay, so that's why they're different. That's definitely something to have on your radar here. Uh, so um, yeah, there, that's maybe a, a little thing to recalibrate here. Uh, this was not the one that they gave us in the problem. It did have this language. John will play only if the situation is hopeless. So that's why this translation will look like P horseshoe H, like that. And again, we can make this all pretty. 
There we go. Get all their core symbol. Yeah. So that's that one. All right. Hopefully that answers your question for there. And then I skipped something, didn't I? We did those. Do, do, do. We did this one. Did that full version. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This one from 12. Yeah. Okay. Now let's go back. Blop. Um. Copy. Actually, I'm going to just copy this whole thing. Take a look at it. Oh, it's not going to do that for me. Great. Okay. Let's pull up exercise 12 because this one had had some uh, interesting instructions to it. So here's 12. Uh, let's make it a little smaller. Given that A, B, and C are true propositions and X, Y, and Z are false propositions, determine the truth values of the following compound propositions. Uh, so I, I mentioned this one before in my other video about the Chapter 6 homework. Um, this is like truth tables on training wheels. You're not giving the full truth table. You're just calculating for one possibility, the possibility in which A, B, C and are true and X, Y, and Z are false. Uh, which problem were you interested in? Number four. Number four. Here we go. Let's just give this one more shot. Hey, there we go. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's weird. So for calculating for this, I'll, I'm going to go to your questions in a second here, Valentina, but let me just show you how you would do it. So they said x, y, and z are false. So we're going to put a false value there for z and a false value there for c. And now we're going to do our sort of calculating inside out, right? So if z is false, now we can figure out how that negation modifies it. So the not z chunk will just be flipped to true. And then once I know that, now I can figure out what's going on with this parenthetical. I ignore this negation right now, right? We're just working inside out. It's outside the parentheses, so we're going to ignore it. So I'm going to cut it off here and have the chunk we're evaluating just be inside the parentheses. It's an or statement with one part being false and the other part being true. So ors, the inclusive or is just asking, is at least one of these things true? That's happening. So that's true. Now that I know this whole chunk is true, I can figure out how this negation is going to modify things. That's okay, just going to flip it to false. There we go. So the answer to this one would be false. Now let me look back at what you were asking about. Z is a false proposition, so not Z inside of the brackets will be true. Yes. FT gives true. I think you're talking about uh, this here, right? With this or statement, it's going to be true when one value is false and the other value is true. Yeah, that's right. Because of the negated parenthetical, the T changes to false. Yes, so this negation outside the parenthetical flips that chunk from true to false. And that's correct. So the main question is about that not Z inside the brackets. Yeah. So negations modify what they what immediately follows them. So this negation is only modifying this letter. If, there, if it's following just a letter, it only applies to that letter. Um, so I can give an example here. <clears throat> if I had not A <clears throat> uh, or B. Gosh, I'll put on caps lock to make it easy, but that didn't work. Um, the way I'd visualize this, the chunking of the different pieces here, is that this negation just modifies the A. That's it. And then I can figure out, you know, from wh whatever value B is and the not A chunk, then I can figure out the whole thing. That's different from what happens when you have not parenthetical A or B. <clears throat> These two things are not equivalent, right? Here, I got to figure out what's going on with the whole A or B part, and then I can figure out how that negation operates. So if, if the negation is followed by just a letter, then it just applies to that letter. If what follows the negation is a parenthetical, I have to calculate that whole parenthetical chunk before I can figure out how the negation is going to modify it. So that's the answer to that question. Um, okay, I think we covered 
everything that people posted about in the discussion thread. Again, if you have more questions, reach out to me. Um, let's talk about it. Uh, I'm happy to help you out with this. And, and if you are struggling with formal logic, don't lose heart. Don't give up on hope here. Um, we can definitely make it happen. I just would say contact me sooner rather than later so we can, we can go over that. Um, exam 2 is going to be coming up in a hot second here, so uh, you'll, we'll want to have that uh, squared away. So let me know how I can help you. Okay, so long for now. I'll see you tomorrow for the thrilling conclusion of the inductive arguments uh, unit and all of our last material leading up to exam two. So we'll talk about argument from analogy and inference of the best explanation. See you then.